welcome everyone to um, the uh, world premiere of uh, <laughs> the uh, disruptive student, well, how to deal with the disruptive student protocol, uh, sponsored by your own team care. Um, today we have very fortunate to have all of you here. Um, hopefully we'll have some trickling in eventually. Um, but I um, just wanted to give you a brief introduction. We at Team Care, we put together a, uh, a handbook uh, with a set of guidelines to deal with certain student situations that have come up uh, over the years of experience that most of Team Care have. And um, we come up with these eight protocols or guidelines, one of them being how to deal with a disruptive student. And we found it fitting to have it as our first, uh, our first workshop. Uh, we've had a lot of, um, I guess, referrals, recommendations from, from the faculty and staff to have such a thing. Uh, so we decided we should go first. Yeah? And for today, we have wonderful guest speakers for you. Uh, first, the first two that we'll be introducing to is um, so Mike Caudry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mike Caudry is an instructor for the Uber Community College Associate in Arts in Teaching program. He is a caring and passionate software educator who has worked in a number of challenging and diverse right. classes across the USA and in Hawaii. Mike's work is primarily focused on developing knowledgeable perspectives for educators and students through contextual understanding and reflective practice is essential to breaking down the barriers to meaningful teaching, authentic learning, and opportunities for student and community success. Welcome, Mr. Michael Kaudry. <laughs> We, tell you who we also have Jeff, Jeff. John, here, <laughs> who is also an instructor for the New York Community College Associate in Arts in Teaching program. They've been teaching educational foundation and educational psychology courses at Leeward for the past four years. Jeff spent 15 years of his career as a secondary science teacher and has also taught physical education at an elementary school for several years. That's it. Yeah, look. I'm laughing. I didn't realize it, you know. So, without further ado, you're going to be for the first 15 minutes. All right, so thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to do a little bit of magic up here. I know we have a limited amount of time. Um, but I just want to start with thinking about the way that I handle this actually in my classroom management class. And when I talk about disruptive students or when I talk about discipline, I actually don't do it until week 12. A lot of people think classroom management is about disciplining students. But I put it towards the end purposefully because if we're thinking about it metaphorically in, in terms of like a fire, okay, the first thing you want to do with regards to fire is what? Put it out. Okay, that's the common response. But really, don't start one, okay? Don't start one, right? So for the first 12 weeks, but I love that response. You know, it's a common one, people love it. Um, but no, actually, yeah, don't start one, right? And so the idea here is that we spend 12 weeks in my course talking about how we can prevent fires before we even talk about what we can do to handle them or work with them. And so the first thing I'd like you to do, okay, is I'd like you to turn your chairs um, 90 degrees towards the center so that you all are facing one another. To, yeah, yeah, facing one another. You don't have to turn the desk. You can just turn the chair. That's fine. Just so your chair is facing one another, OK? And this is just representing the idea that, so if everybody, I love that you guys are doing it. I love that you, I like that nice turn, OK? So if you can turn that chair. Let's give a round of applause to the people who are doing it. Let's just see if we can bring everybody in. Everybody in. Everybody in. Just turn that chair. All right. Thank you so much. I love it. Thank you very much for coming. Um, OK. And so this is just to signify, when you walk in the classroom, you may have to rearrange the desks in order to create the environment that you want for effective learning and engagement, OK? And just changing it up can provide a little bit of novelty to the students that can kind of, oh, what's going to happen today? Well, why is it set up like this? Or what are we doing? And so we're working for that. OK, what I'd like you to do now is, OK, I'd like you to just, like church style, 
turn around, okay, obviously recognizing we have a, uh, uh, someone at the back, I want you just to introduce you to yourself to the people that are behind you or around you. And just introduce yourself, say your name, who you are. <laughs> Okay, notice I had just, you guys were doing your thing, and I had a nice, easy attention getter. I didn't get upset, I didn't get uh, unnerved. I knew that you guys were eventually gonna come back around, right? Because I've done this a thousand times, and everybody else has done it a hundred times, um, or maybe a hundred thousand times like Bobby. <laughs> but we know that it works. We, <laughs> we know that it's gonna come, that you guys are gonna come back, okay? And so that's just kind of, Getting you, the teacher, around the idea that we have to get to know one another. This classroom is a sacred space, like church or like court or however it is. You need to open it up, you know? You need to really drive home why are we here, but also uh, you need to make sure that at some point in time um, that you're developing those relationships with one another and the students so that we have that responsibility to one another, that social contract, okay? Um, so what you have in front of you or may not have in front of you, if you do have a, a, a stack, can you just pass those out to the people in your group? What you have there is a, uh, a do now, okay? And I just want you to fill out that phrase. If you have a writing utensil, if you need an imaginary writing utensil, you could write it in the sky or you could write it in your mind if you don't have one. If we have, oh, thank you so much. Because a good teacher is always prepared. Thank you so much. Do you need? Okay. And so this is just a little bit of something to get your hamster running, okay? Get the hamster on the wheel. This is in reference to a classroom situation. Yes, this is all in reference to a classroom situation. This is sort of, you know, this is a, uh, this is what I'm doing is contextualizing it. Well, I just did contextualize it. This is a classroom situation. This is what I might do, right? All of these actually, all of these things are actual strategies. And so when I came in here, I wanted to actually do some things that I might do in my classroom to help build that. So for example, I might say, I get angry and frustrated when a student walks in late. Yeah, sure, Thank you could you. say that. But it could be any, oh no, this, this is not a relationship. Oh, not. No, this is just anything with regards to your life. Oh, okay. Oh, this, no. That's why oh. I want to clarify. Okay, sorry, no. Well, that, that was, um, you, just, you just complete the, That's it's like a Mad Lib, you just okay. complete it. Yeah, sorry, thanks, Jeff. I get angry and frustrated when somebody interrupts my great teaching. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly it. That's a perfect example. Okay. And so you have that, right? Okay. Everybody good? Everybody got something down? Okay. Everybody got, thanks for coming today. Thank you very much. I'm glad you're here, Chris. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yes. If you want to put something else in the collection plate, Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. Oh, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. How's your hamster? Yeah. Is he running? Yes. Okay, good. Let's think about that. Okay. There's plenty of time. Feel free. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you. Okay. And so what I'm doing there is just acknowledging I'm getting your brain going, but I'm also coming around. I'm holding you accountable for thinking, right? You have to contribute, and I might draw this out, but we don't necessarily have the time. I might draw out what is actually on those papers um, in a normal classroom situation, but I'm coming and making contact with you. I'm checking in with you. I'm seeing that you're there. I'm letting you know that I'm there. I'm just making sure that you're prepared and ready to learn, right? Okay, and then I might say, can we all rise up? Can we all stand up, okay? Can we stand and let us prepare to learn, okay? Let us be learned, okay? Let us be washed in knowledge, 
Okay? All right. <laughs> okay, and what I want to do is, I know you guys are all here because we want to know how to handle disruptive students. So can I have a volunteer from the audience? Yes, yes. Oh, you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you come up here? I certainly yeah. can. Do you have a writing utensil for the board? I sure Excellent. do. And what we're going to do, I'd like you guys just to kind of have a shout out, okay? Um, obviously recognizing there's, there's plenty of us in the room, but let's have a shout out. What are the issues that we're having in our classrooms that we want to learn how to deal with? What are any of the issues that are coming up for Texting. people? Texting. Excellent. Texting and media use, maybe even laptop use. And all that stuff, right? And that stuff is great for supporting learning, but it's also great for distracting learning. Constant conversation. Constant talking. Excellent, excellent. What else? Feel free to shout them out. Other work or working during lecture or working during class. So maybe distracted behavior or not on task. OK. What about any issues with group work? <laughs> OK, well, not, keep. Not taking the leadership role and just, oh. just, just like, you know, not having to do the work. OK, yeah. so in, in issues with group work and as far as roles and responsibilities, OK. That's the term. Social yeah. loafing. Oh, that social is the loafing. academic term. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else? Anything else that people have heard about? I know many of you uh, don't have those issues in your classrooms, but. Unprepared. Unprepared. Excellent. Anything else? Just not contributing. OK, not contributing, not participating. OK, good. And that do now is an excellent way of drawing them in, because they have to contribute something. And then I might ask for it to be anonymous. And so I'll just I'll do a random poll. OK, what's going on in this classroom? Random poll. Another way I might do that, I didn't actually bring that. Um, actually, and, and you may sit. OK, good. Just good stretch, you know? Just get them up. Just move them. You might use this in the beginning of the class. You might use it in the middle. You might use it towards the end. However, seventh inning stretch, everybody loves. How about rude behavior? Rude behavior. Yes. Dude. Inappropriate. <laughs> I love that you're bringing interesting ideas to the classroom space. Right? Interrupting. OK, good. So that's, yeah. Good. And so um, let's choose a couple. Do you want to choose a couple? What do you think is the most common problem we all face? Yeah. Okay, let's start there. That's let's definitely start there. a good That's one. Perfect. All right. And so, what would we do now? What would I do if I'm having issues in the problem? Uh, sorry, if I'm having issues in the classroom, and I'm going, oh, geez, this person keeps texting. What do I do? The first thing I'm going to do is go find an expert. You know, I might say, so is there any experts in the audience today? Hmm. Hmm. Anybody? Oh, hey, are you, ma'am? Are you an expert? <laughs> Judging from your, uh, you know, your dyed hair. <laughs> <laughs> but I might say, hey, Bobby, I have this student who's in my classroom who is texting, and I don't know what to do. So I like to work the room, although I won't because <laughs> You can work it. <laughs> but I work the room, so I continue to lecture or talk, but I walk and stand right by that friend who's texting. I don't make a big issue out of it. I don't want to take time away from learning or my teaching. But I want to just have that proximity that lets them know I know what's going on and you can put it away. I actually got to the point one with one student who was chronic, 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 and really didn't want to be in my class. And who likes that? Where at the end of the class, I said, you know, if it's going to be too much of a distraction, I'll happily hold on to your phone for you. And I'll give it back at the end of class. Because remember, they're just taller than, six, than five and six-year-olds, right? They're just taller. So he's like taking away that toy and holding on to it until the end of class. Well, clearly he got the message. Did not hand me the phone, but he did not text anymore. So those two things worked for me. Excellent. And that proximity, honestly, might be the most powerful thing. And sometimes we have to look at our teaching practice. Sometimes we look at, have to look at how we work the room. Many of us, working the room is like doing one of these. You know? <laughs> you know, that's, you feel like you're working the room. Or maybe from here to the computer, right? And you got the thing, you got the podium up here, and you're leaning up against it. Right? How many of you like to stay in your safe spot? This you is know, your safe teachers spot. still do it. I'm not saying that all teachers do for certain, but you know, just get out there and just walk and monitor. We call it monitoring or using that little bit of proximity, and that'll help to sort of build that engagement. To do that, that means your physical space has to be arranged how? So you can walk around. So your physical space has to be uh, set up before. 
If you can't get to somebody in the back, yeah, create a space that allows you to get to somebody to the back. Yeah. Oh, May sorry. I continue, Michael? While of course you passing? can, yeah. Who else has an idea of how to deal with texting oh, while, this, while you are talking or somebody else is talking? That is such a good educational psychology perspective. That's all excellent. <laughs> now, you actually assume they don't know the behavioral expectations before they come to class? I assume that they know a lot of them, but don't, aren't used to doing it. Well, the assumption, assume oh, sorry. That they don't know many that I would like them to know. That's well, the, an excellent point. The assumption should be zero. Yeah. The assumption should be zero. They do not know how to come to a physical space and move amongst each other in a socially accepted way. So one of the things that I make sure I do in a behavioral expectation is we create something called the professional will, which you could call it a positive will. And all we do is talk at the beginning of class, we talk about the things that we don't like happening in class. And then we talk about what would be some wonderful things would happen in class that makes it a really positive and fun learning environment so that everyone gets an opportunity to participate fully. So all we do is we create this will as a class, and we put it up somewhere in the room, and then when somebody is experiencing this, instead of saying, hey, you, get off your phone, we say an iMessage, which would be another one, I notice that you're on the phone a lot, we agreed as a class to try to bring everybody up to this level. Here's the kicker. What strategies do you think we could have you do in which to get up here? So we put the responsibility back on the student, and all of a sudden they have to say, oh yeah, I probably shouldn't be on the phone. And they solve the problem for you. And it becomes a we situation rather than a you and me situation. So I messages are very important. And it's a little bit larger. It's like a social contract. It's a and social so contract. actually, I don't use the professionalism wheel. That's not, that doesn't work for me. And you have to find something that works, that for, works you. for you. And so what I do at the beginning is actually a values contract. And I spend time um, at the beginning of the class, but also sometimes at the beginning of each session, uh, at the beginning of the course, rather, and sometimes at the beginning of each session, just examining what our values are. And if I see students that aren't displaying them, and you actually have this in your packet, if I see students that aren't displaying them, I might revisit what we've said we were going to do. And how I've might you do that? Through a? Through a visual cue. <laughs> I might use a visual cue. So right? sometimes at the And that's why Jeff brings the wheel out. And right. every time Jeff brings the wheel out, they know that's the discussion they're going to have. You know? Um, and so you, yeah, go ahead. Well, we'll, we'll, I'll do this at the beginning of class. I'll say, this is so hard for me. <laughs> I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to put it away because I'm hooked on this thing pretty bad. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm hooked on this. So I'm gonna, it's going to be hard, but I'm going to put this away. Yeah. And that's a visual reminder every day just to let you know we don't pull it out. Right, and that's a good, visual cues are great, but also sort of um, when working with the cell phone issue, same side politics works, we call it same side politics. I also have a phone. My phone sometimes goes off. I'm unfortunately, sometimes I forget to turn it off. It's okay, what do you think I should do as a teacher in that case? Well, I probably should just take it out, turn it off and move on. You know, try to be as, as, as uh, less uh, distracting as I possibly can be, but I also recognize that you guys have families, you have jobs, you have emergencies. And so it is your right and responsibility to leave the room if you so choose, if you have something else that's going on. Obviously recognizing I'll look for a pattern if it's happening again and again and again, you know, then we might have to have a conversation, I might send you an email, we might have to have a check-in and just see where we are, right? But I know things come up and that's okay and I know we forget to turn things off and that's okay too. But let's just try to be responsible to one another. And so I might include that on my um, values list, you know? and break it down, you know, and have them sign. Good. Okay, that's the time, that's the yeah. time. Do you time. your values list? You know, for one of my classes I do, for my intro class I do when they're just coming into the AAT program, I do. Um, for my more, uh, for the higher level courses, we build them together. 
And I don't think there's any reason why you can't build them together. You can build them together with kindergartners, right, Bobby? Absolutely. Yeah. You should actually. Yeah. Exactly. And so you, there's different ways you can guide the conversation if there's things you want to include or be part of the conversation. But I think, I mean, I think building them together is good, you know. Yeah. I think as things for groups of students who are less and less likely to know how to be good students or want to be, you should build them in their beginning together. Definitely. Absolutely. You know, and it's just from every single coach, anyone who has coached sports before knows that you have to Practice, 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 practice all the time. Rehearse. Let's run it again. Let's run it again. Let's run it again. You know, and sometimes as teachers, we get in the classroom and we just assume that everybody's going to know how to run the drill because they've all been in a million classrooms. But not every classroom is run the same. And it's our responsibility as the teacher to set it up the way we want without assuming they're already going to come in there and know how to behave in our classroom. Okay, so you want to end it on community relationships because we're out of time. Okay. Um, yeah, well. This is the underlying thing for yeah. all of these. I would say, I mean, in that preventative way is developing the relationships in the classroom, finding out about your students, knowing your students by name, um, having that sort of personal connection, checking in with them every once in a while. Um, I, uh, I, I, one of the things I always check in with my students at the very beginning of class, I make sure I know their names by the second class. I have to make an effort to do that. In the beginning, I tell them how boring my life is, so I need to live through their lives, and they need to tell me exciting things going on so that I can live vicariously through them. And it creates a really fun dialogue at the beginning of class, and then I'll tie it into whatever we're doing that day, and we'll move on. But we check in yeah. every, every time so that when we do groups, everybody knows each other, everybody feels comfortable, especially when we get to the tougher stuff. And group work and throwing in a team building activity somewhere halfway in through the semester is not a bad idea. Obviously, team building can be five minutes. You know, it doesn't have to be 40 minute activity. If you wanted to, if you have that space in your classroom, that's fine. Um, but, but yeah. But all of this requires an effort. Yeah. If you don't want these things to occur, don't make an effort. Just come in and teach your class, and these things will occur for sure. Yeah. But if you don't want them to occur, you have to make the effort to assume that they, these things are not taught and teach them to the students. Yeah, procedurally, procedurally even. And so what I gave you guys was just a simple handout, um, some things that we came up with as a group, as an AAT group, um, of ways you might address some of those common problems, because they really are simple. Um, obviously, recognizing in some situations it may be a little bit more difficult you know, than others, but that's okay. That's just the role uh, or the responsibility of the teacher in that particular classroom. Um, there's a, an example of um, UDL teaching strategies, which is universal de design for learning. It's just that you're chunking instruction and that you're moving through material in different ways to keep everybody engaged and involved. Because as soon as they're bored, as soon as they're frustrated, you know that's when they're going to bring out the text. You know that's when they're going to bring out the computer. You know that's when they're going to start talking and do the disruptive behaviors. And so those are just some simple things that we do to try to um, address those. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, just give them a hand. So, Mike and Jeff gave you some wonderful strategies to create a positive and safe, engaging learning environment, okay? the proactive, preventive strategies. Um, we need to continue on. We're going to go, if that doesn't work, <laughs> we have to take it to the next level as instructors. And we have here. Steve Matos, did I start some credit? Steve Matos, yeah, good. And just a little bit about Mr. Mike Matos. Leave it up there, Mike. Yeah. I didn't know if you wanted to use the Totally. Board. Leave it up there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. awesome. Good. Thanks, Mike. All right. I'm going to erase that, though. I'll erase that one, yeah. but this one I, wanna, I do want to keep up. Okay, good. Uh, I can do it. I can do it. I got you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so Mike Matos. Hello. Okay, he's a uh, social worker who has been working in the okay. helping profession for over 20 years. He has spent the majority of his career of his career as a licensed professional working with children and their families, providing individual, group, and family therapy. Mike is currently the chair of the BSW program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Myron B. Thompson School of Social Work, and is a 2008 recipient of the Francis Davis Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. Please welcome my sister, Michael Dina. Thanks. Uh, first, that was impressive. I, I was, I called Cami yesterday and I said, you know, I forgot what the time frame was. And then when I looked and found out it was 45 minutes, I freaked out and said, how are we possibly going to cover this in 45 minutes? 
after just watching Mike and uh, Jeff go, I'm like, okay, I guess it can be done. They did a, such an awesome job in such a little time. That was perfect. I would argue, um, actually for them, not against them, that classroom management is preventative. Um, it really is one of those activities that you do on a daily basis where you're forming relationships with your students. And really, what you're trying to do is establish a sense of uh, control on their part in their learning experience. There's an old adage um, that people don't like change, and I think that's flawed. I think people don't like to be changed. And I think the more control they have over their experience, the better off they are, and the better off the classroom is. Um, let's go through this. And I, again, I threw this together. We might have to catch the front light so it's more visible. Thank you. That's one? That's good. That's good. OK. So here's. Here's kind of what we're going to do today. There's a few takeaways. We're going to talk about losing control. I think ultimately, when we talk about texting or when we talk about um, sleeping in the class, when we talk about those types of things, one of the concerns is that the behavior in the, in, in the environment is going to disrupt the learning of the other students. And there's also this kind of unspoken fear that when that happens, I'm losing control of the classroom. It's fascinating how our loss of control of the classroom exactly correlates with the student's own losing of control. And I'll explain kind of how that happens. Uh, we'll talk about how to get control back. Interestingly, we'll talk about it uh, as helping our students win, helping our students feel a sense of control, and thus we get a sense of control in the classroom. And then we'll talk about making good decisions. See, I did that again, and I can't tell you why. Because, because the time frame is so short, I want to start with the takeaways. So that for, if for whatever reason there's a fire drill, something happens, and we, we don't complete this, you'll get this. First, um, most student problems aren't about school. Um, in fact, typically they're family, work, friends. Sometimes there's something psychological going on. Sometimes there's a behavioral issue. Sometimes there's a chemical issue. It's very rare. If you look at the number of students who've struggled in your classes, and I'm not just talking about students who are losing control in class and, and acting out. I'm talking about kids that are struggling with grades. It's, it's actually much more common to find kids who are struggling with grades because they've been up all night with childcare issues, that they've had difficulties on the work front, that they're in a fight with their partner. Those types of issues outside of the academic setting oftentimes impact the academic setting. So first, it's, it's, you have to assume that it's likely from an external source and not an academic source. What that means is that, in, in a very real sense, it's likely true that A, you're not the cause of the problem, although you may be one of those who could greatly help your client or your student in the intervention of that problem, but you're probably not the intended target either. Now that doesn't mean you don't run risks and, and could potentially get hurt, it just means that it was an unintentional bystander. You, you, as an unintentional bystander, might have been in the thrall of it. Um, most who act out, when our students do act out, when these strategies in the classroom don't work, uh, which is rare, by the way, those strategies are as close to foolproof as you can get. But when those strategies don't work out, it's important to know that oftentimes that student is feeling alone and isolated for whatever reason, whether that's the result of a breakup, whether that's the result of a return from a military engagement and they feel that no one can relate to them. There's any number of reasons why someone could feel isolated and alone. And finally, I think the most important takeaway today, today, the most important message that I have for you is that every time someone loses control, student, teacher, anybody, oftentimes it's inevitably an attempt to regain control and I'll explain how that happens. Cool? By the way, I would love and I told Cami that I was going to say this. This is a discussion that we could have at another date in an expanded session. I would love to hear more that you guys were able to get through that in 15 minutes was awesome. I'd love to see two, three hours dedicated to this. And, and maybe that's something that can be arranged. Just because I think the subject is so important. And whether it's me or Mike or Joe, that's less relevant. What's more relevant is that this material gets talked about and discussed in a larger, in a larger framework. Any questions about that? Make sense? Okay, so that's, just know that off, right off the bat. So let's talk about the ups and downs in life. Um, 
remember those old biorhythm charts that we used to have that tell you, oh, at this time of the day you're up, this time of the day you're down, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, that's, that's right. Some of us. Um, yeah, we're showing our age. Those, those biorhythm charts kind of, what they were trying to tell us is that we weren't always happy, we weren't always sad, we weren't always energized, we weren't always down, and that we kind of cycle. The truth is, is that we do cycle, that we have peaks and valleys. Sometimes those peaks are real high. You know, you're, you're acknowledged for your teaching experience, you do a great presentation, and sometimes the lows are particularly low. They're not just the time of the day. You've had a bad day, a student is struggling in your class, or, or in fact, you as an instructor are having trouble at home with your partner. You as an instructor are having difficulties in your work setting. You as an instructor are having difficulty in your social life. The same issues that block a student from learning in your classroom or managing themselves in the classroom prevent you from managing yourself in the classroom. You're, you are as susceptible to that as the students you work for. So we get under stress. There's two types of stress, eustress and distress. What's eustress? Any idea? Yeah. <laughs> That's when Bobby's in charge of the stress. You did it. Eustress is good stress. That's, that's all it is. Distress is bad stress. Um, when, when we look at, when we look at uh, stress creators in our life, there's a few predictable ones. Loss of a loved one, huge stressor. What's interesting is when we look at stress levels, oftentimes what's one of the greatest stressors in our life is one of the best. Having a child is considered a high stress moment. It's a eustress moment, but the anxieties, the fears, your body doesn't really know the difference between good stress and bad stress. When you're stressed and excited, or you're stressed and anxious, your heart rate goes up, the energy in your body is looking for outlets, you begin to see early signs of anxiety, toe tapping, uh, pencil chewing, those types of things, whether it's good stress or bad stress. That's important for us, by the way, because that means that there are early warning signs that we can look for. Uh, feelings and emotions. When, when, I like, when I think of stress, I immediately think of the types of reactions our bodies have to stress. And what's interesting, and interesting to reframe that, is this notion of emotion as, as energy in motion. We learned a long time that, that energy doesn't dissipate, it just changes place, it changes location, gets transmuted. Well, this energy in motion notion is that if your body is anxious, if you're feeling anxious emotionally, your body is going to have to find a place for that to go. And inevitably, you see it in, in the muscles in your body and in the reactions of your body. How many of you have ever walked into a room, and the moment you walked into the room, you, you felt anxious, you felt on edge? Yeah? Yeah, of course, of course. How many of you have ever walked into a room, and the moment you walk into the room, you feel relaxed? Of course. Now, some would say that's an intu you know, it's a part of our intuition. I would argue that a lot of that, though, is not so much sixth sense as much as, as, it, as it is sharp senses. What do I mean by that? Well, when you see people in the room that are relatively relaxed, you pick up on that, and you're likely to be relaxed. You mirror what you see. When you walk into a room and you see people anxious, and how do you know they're, they're doing this? Right? They're, they're pacing. They're, and you've been that. You've been in a meeting where everyone's they're, they're talking fast, they're sharing. Their, their, their vocal expressions are less melodic, they're becoming more demanding. Those types of things we pick up on, and that kind of sends our, our signals uh, racing. The key to this, though, is when we're talking about eustress and distress, it's important to know that A, your body can't tell the difference between good or bad stress. And the good news about that is that you can begin to pick up on stressors in your, in your students, or, or the expressed anxiety in your students. Also, that the moment you see that in your student, the earlier you see that in your student, and by the way, the earlier you see it in yourself, the sooner you can intervene. So let's, let's explore this a little bit. So this is just kind of that map. So life's natural peaks, life's natural valleys. Let's talk a little bit about stress and its impact. As a general rule, stress triggers fight or flight. Really, really simple. Uh, and primitive, the saber-toothed tiger, the educational psychology comment. What's, what's interesting is we enter fight or flight as a form of preservation. But what's fascinating about fight or flight is that 
there's, there's these two components. There's, on the one hand, we may enter fight or flight as a result of an anxiety. The other is that we might enter fight or flight as a result of a fear. It's important to know the difference. If you see a saber-toothed tiger, you enter fight or flight, that's because it's real and you're scared. If you think about a saber-toothed tiger and you get scared, that's an anxiety. And in fact, what's fascinating about anxieties is that they are always rooted either in the past or in the future. It's very rarely rooted in the now. And in fact, when you're dealing with somebody who's anxious, one of your first tasks is to get them into the here and now. What you'll hear in the conversation is that they're talking oftentimes about what has happened or what may happen. And, and that's critical for you to understand. So again, fear is seeing a tiger and running. Anxiety is thinking about a tiger and running. Believe it or not, we think about tigers all the time. We do. We, we pen our worst case scenarios in the tablet in our brain, and we begin to react to that tablet, to that narrative, to that story that we tell ourselves. And oftentimes, that student is coming in with a story that they've already got running, that they've already got coursing. And that could mean that they're thinking about their boyfriend or their girlfriend, and what happened last night, and what they're going to go do today and what's going to happen after class. Or it could be that they're thinking about what's going to happen with you in your class and how they're going to fake it because they didn't do their homework last night because they were in a fight with their girlfriend and the police were called and blah, blah, blah. Right? So all of those things uh, can impact and lead to loss of control. Questions? Anything? Nothing? Oh, see that? That was behind the back. That was pretty good. OK, stress and its impact. Oh, doesn't that look like, how many of you uh, saw Seinfeld? Doesn't that look like Elaine? I saw that picture and I was like, hey, that's Elaine. OK, so let's talk about this continuum of control from docile to hostile. First, oh, by the way, we, when we think of this docile to hostile train or, or uh, continuum, it really is this notion that the earlier I intervene, the better off my, my student is going to be. But let's, let's talk about this a little bit. What, is, what does it look like when somebody is docile? Give me some ideas. They're just relaxed and do whatever they probably do and get to that. OK, yeah, because their muscles are relaxed, they're not, this, isn't, this isn't the relaxed student. By the way, and you might not want a docile student in your class. It, I mean, it may be good as a safety measure, but it's not necessarily good as, as a, a learning place, right? But, but that notion, when we think of somebody who's completely docile, we think of large muscles being relaxed. We think of the face. There, there's two places that are the best to determine whether somebody's anxious or not, whether they're docile or hostile. The first is the face, and the second is the hands. That's right. So, so Mike goes, and Jeff goes, hmm. Yeah, exactly. Why? Because they have the most muscles. They have the most muscles. So when, when tension uh, becomes part of their experience, that's the first place it's going to show. So the face is calm, relaxed, brown. They're totally cool. They're cruising. Uh, hands are generally limp, meaning that they're, they're not balled up. They're not, they're not tapping like this. And going, None of that. Um, their breathing is regular and rhythmic, not necessarily slow. Everybody has their own rhythm. By the way, when you walk around the classroom and you get to know your students, you get to learn their rhythms. And it's really important. And it's going to be even critical later in the discussion. Because it could be, for instance, that one of your students who's incredibly laid back like Bobby, that she'll get, she'll get excited and her voice will accelerate. The, the tone of her voice will get higher. And it could be that somebody else who normally speaks very high will actually drop. So what's important to know is that kind of baseline. This is where, where how much you know your, your students comes in. So breathing is regular and rhythmic, not necessarily slow. And speech is melodic. Melodic simply means that when you ask a question, it goes up at the end, right? And when you make a statement, generally it falls. That Knowing that, again, can be critical. We take that for granted. But everyone in the room, if, if you were to take some time, would realize that you've had that encounter where all of a sudden you're thinking, wait a minute, he asked me a question, but that was a statement. That's one of the indicators of stress. And by the way, 
if a student is, is asking about a particular assignment and they say, so, am I supposed to use APA formatting? That what they're really telling you is, this is what I think it is. I'm not really asking. I'm telling you, and I'm looking for affirmation. That's cool, right? But we, we know right away that that's not a question. That's a statement. That's very cool in that situation. That's not so cool when somebody says, you want to make it out of here alive. <laughs> that's much less cool, right? But that's, but that's that shift. That's that shift. So let's talk about my, so we know what docile looks like, right? There's, um, there's a Shel Silverstein poem called uh, The Perfect High where he talks about this, this cat Bubba Fats, super good poem. But he, with the way he describes them, oh, that's the image I get in my head about what docile is, a cool Bubba Fats sitting on a hill. Um, so what does mild anxiety look, look like? First, the smaller muscles begin to move. The first place, face and hands, right? So that's this, all that kind of stuff. Um, the sooner you identify that, the better off you are. So if, if I see Mike and Mike is a cruiser, you know, cool guy, cool cat. I'm not. I didn't, I didn't say I cruiser in a, in, a, in a accusing way, but I although, I, was, although I watched him swinging this, I got a little nervous. Um, but if all of a sudden he's not presenting that way, and I know him, I formed a relationship with him, he's my student, every day I say, hey Mike, how's things shaking? And he's always cool, and all of a sudden I see behavior that's different, that means that it's gonna be incumbent on me to make sure that he's okay. Not only for my own personal safety, but I care about him. I care about my students. But I also care about the other students. So I, I might say, and, and by the way, I'm not afraid to do this either. If I say, hey Mike, how's your, how you doing? And he goes, eh. I go, hey. You got some time after class? Let's talk. You know, or, or if I feel like we have enough time before class, I'll say, hey, what's going on? Well, sometimes even the acknowledgement, they want to get it out. So they may just have something to say. Or, so sometimes either proximity or a question directed their, their way yep. might relieve some of that. Totally. Yeah. I, had a, I had a coworker that I worked with. I, I worked for five years at a psychiatric hospital. And what was interesting about the psychiatric hospital is everyone there, by definition, is a danger to themselves or somebody else. And I worked with this guy, his name was Bruce, phenomenal. But what he would do every time he came on the unit is he'd make personal contact with every kid. And so he'd come up, and his, his notion, he got to know the kids, so he'd learn physical space. So he'd know where touch is okay, where touch is not okay. But it wouldn't be unusual for him to say, hey, Mike, how's it going? And there, he said there were two things that he wanted the student to know, or in our case, the psychiatric client to know. One was that he was interested in what was going on in his life. The other was that so many of the people that we worked to, with had these traumatic backgrounds. And as long as he understood that kid, he knew that that physical contact was a way of letting him know that we could be close and still safe. Yeah. It's, it, becomes a, it becomes a messenger of, of that safety. So smaller muscles begin to move. Um, the face shows tension, uh, squinting. Actually, this is kind of good in class, right? You see the student, and you mention some, some crazy theory, and they go like this, they go, right? That means they're grappling with the material. That's a great sign. That's a great sign. So again, it's not that we want docile students. Trust me, we want our students to experience a, a healthy level of stress that's reflective of their involvement with the work, with the classroom, and with the instructor. So none of this is necessarily bad. Where it becomes an early warning sign is when this becomes quite different from what you usually see. Um, hands become active, uh, finger tapping, pencil swinging, those types of things. Um, some begin to hold their breath. Uh, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm one of those breath holders where I'll think about something, I'll, and I'll, oh God, please. Um, so you'll, you'll get to see that. Actually, you know where you see that a lot is in athletics. The first thing, a good, a good coach will recognize when one of their athletes is struggling to learn a particular move or a particular um, uh, technique, and they'll often scream, breathe, breathe. Keep breathing through, through the movement. Um, and then the speech begins to show delays or become overly quick. Again, each of us have, has our own pace and rhythm. When that, rate, when that pace and rhythm changes, that's something you should be alert to. Again, th 
I keep going back to them because you won't know whether it's changed if you don't have a relationship with the student to start with. So if you don't have that first 12 weeks or whatever it is for you to get to know that student and establish a rhythm, you won't know when they fall out of it. So you're suggesting we be cognitively aware of our social space and reading our environment. Just like he said. <laughs> That's exactly it. That in my bio. That's right. <laughs> I thought I heard that in your bio. There are a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> and then finally, there's vigilance. Yeah, Cammie? Yes, absolutely. In fact, my guess is that everyone right now, if, if you're an instructor and you think about your classroom, you know those students who are what some would label anxious types. That they are the constant pencil tappers. And those. You wouldn't worry about those. You'd worry about those when they reach the next phase, when they appear to be sli what we call sliding. Um, your docile student, this becomes your first level of warning sign. Your anxious student, and again, no judgment here, you stress, distress, but that student that generally is a bit more high strung, more engaged, more involved, that shows some of this kind of engagement, these types of engagement signs, you wouldn't worry at this level. Of course, you'd have to know that by having the relationship with your client or your student. I guess my biggest concern is yeah. that we see students on an appointment basis. Yep. So, you know, I don't have that regular contact. I mean, I might develop a relationship over time, but. I don't see them weekly at the same time every time. Yep. So can you also provide some pointers about that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, on in the you're a counselor? What what's the appointment? I work with job prep services, so we advise on resumes and public Okay. Services. Okay. So as a general rule, one of the things that you should assume right off the bat is that having an appointment with somebody, particularly an authority figure, is anxiety provoking to start with. So you should assume that right from the get-go. Many of our students have not intentionally engaged in that type of relationship prior to you, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So assume that right off the bat. The other is when you see this type of behavior, the moment you go to that student and say, so tell me about how you're feeling now. What's this experience like for you now? It's a little bit like doing an assessment in the classroom. OK, are we all here? What's going on in our lives? And it, and it gives you that early indicator. You can actually do that um, by asking a student not what their future holds, but what their recent past held. What's been going on for you lately? You know, And tell me a little bit about what you're hoping for the future. But in order for me to understand your future, I might need to understand a little bit of your past. You'd be surprised how quickly they'll talk about things, especially when you're engaging, when, when, you, when you're good at forming that relationship. You'd be surprised how quickly they'll tell you what's going on. And then oftentimes, what I'll do is I'll note in a file, in my student file, how they present. Just so that when I go back, because I see a lot of students. I've got 70 students that I see on a regular basis. And I get to know them pretty well. But those first couple of meetings, they're one amongst many. And I'll just put a little note uh, about how they presented to me. you know, And that way, when I see them next, I'll have a sense. I'll have a sense. But I would assume that these are signs of anxiety. What you don't know is whether it's eustress or distress, whether that anxiety is, is normal or, or something more than that, because you don't have the baseline. But assume that this is anxious already. You just don't know if that's the pre-wiring or not. Any other, by the way, feedback from other experts in the room? What, what's been your experience when you don't have the luxury of a baseline? Excuse yourself and ask. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, uh, this gets back to something Mike was talking about earlier. When, when you're checking in with them, it lets that student know that you're there for them. I'll often identify when there's a conflict between what I see and what I hear. So if Mike goes, yeah, everything's just great, I'll go, wow, Mike, it doesn't, I don't know, I don't know how to make sense of that. Because it, what I heard you say is everything's great, but it looks like something's up. And again, oftentimes a student really values that acknowledgement. There's a social contract, isn't there? The social contract is that I'm supposed to say, hey, how's things going? And you're supposed to say, fine. And we very rarely expect somebody to actually question that. I think the moment you do, you begin what I would call a legitimate relationship with that person. 
And legitimating that relationship, it becomes the invitation to share. Well, the next thing would be, how do you respond, or how should you respond, I think this is an important one, when they say, I don't feel well, because you don't expect that. Yeah, And if yeah. someone says, I feel shitty, yeah. it's called, they need that acknowledgement. Absolutely. And when we start going, ah, 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 yeah. that, that becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah. And that's when you engage kind of the daily skills of your discourse. That's what's fascinating about what we do as instructors and what we do as counselors and what we do in our professional setting is that the skills we use are human skills that we've refined over the years. When, if somebody were to tell me, hey, I feel shitty, I'd say, hey, talk to me about it. What's up? And, and I'm not there to be their therapist. I'm not there to be their counselor. But I may be able to get them to a therapist or counselor. I may be able to get them to a resource. I won't be able to do that if I'm not willing to listen to them. Then they're stuck. They're stuck. And we miss a golden opportunity, not only to form a relationship, a better relationship with our student, even more importantly, because it's not just about us, we lose the opportunity to get them the, some of the help they may need. And open honesty and sincerity, I don't think necessarily have to be an emotional experience, right? Yeah. As, as a counselor, I know that we have one of the most wonderful counselors in the world, and she's just honest and open and loves the students, and yep. she wants to hear, and she's not thinking about what she's gonna do next, she's thinking yep. about what's right in front Right here, right now. Yeah. Exactly. And by the way, as, as, a, as a kind of way of being, I think generally if you ask somebody how they're doing, you should be prepared for whatever they share. Otherwise, don't ask. You know? Again, but that, def that flies in the, in, the, in the social contract, so to speak, where everyone's response is the same. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. You want to be known as that person for, for whom there can be an honest response. That's when, that's when you know that's, that that student is there, is there to learn. Not just learn about what's going on in the classroom, but to learn much bigger lessons. And I think that's an honor that, that we as instructors feel when a student does feel comfortable enough to come to us and share sometimes things you just don't <laughs> want to hear. No, absolutely. <laughs> but I feel very honored that, they, that that's that close relationship. You're that person in their life. You know? yeah. It's humbling, isn't it? It is. It's and humbling. Not be that only person. That's right. Actually, you know what's funny, is, and again, this, there's, there's research that shows that when, when we look at people who've been successful in their life, and we look back at their childhood and young adulthood, there are two, two core components that are in place. One is that they're passionate about something, and passion in this case is described as um, being willing to sacrifice for, not feeling hot and horny, that's a different kind of passion, <laughs> where, where you say, this is what I want to do, and I'm willing to sacrifice these other things to do it. They have a passion and they have a caring adult in their life. And for many of our students, we're that caring adult. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that our class becomes one of their passions. Maybe, maybe not. But they don't have to be passionate about your class to, be, to recognize you as one of the important people in their lives. I have a lot of students who take my class who never go on for social work, but I still have a relationship with them. And they'll call me after they've pursued their other degree. You know, whatever that other degree may be, or even if they drop out of school. You, you may be that person. It's incredibly humbling. It's incredibly humbling. Okay, vigilance. Does anyone know what vigilance is besides keep? <laughs> it is being aware. And the way that you can tell whether somebody is vigilant is, is through the eyes. And what happens is, when you're vigilant, what you're doing is you're searching the environment for potential risks. That's all vigilance is. Hypervigilance is that accentuated, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But every good teacher is vigilant. Every good teacher is vigilant. They're trying to make eye contact with everyone in the room at some point. Right? So they're, they're trying to figure out where each student is at at any given moment. Are they paying attention? Are they involved? Are they engaged? If they're not engaged, the good teacher might come up next to you and say, you know, have a discussion or, or uh, whatever. But there's always this attempt to engage. If you're not vigilant, you're not a good teacher. You're not a good teacher. Because you need to know where your students are. There's a difference, though, between vigilance and hypervigilance. So let's talk about high anxiety, not uh, the Woody Allen and the Woody Allen notion. Um, large, muscle, large muscles become active. The assumption, uh, or not even an assumption, what we know is that when you have mild anxiety, small muscles involved. As you get more anxious, large muscles involved. By the way, as a general rule, Teachers who pace the room, work the room, as, as they were talking about, they're getting their large muscles involved. Again, 
your stress, a, a good anxiety, a healthy anxiety, making sure that everyone's engaged, everyone's involved. Um, that needs to be a potential warning sign for you, though, in your students, that when those large muscle groups begin to become involved, um, those are things you should be concerned about. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of these. By the way, and, and I'll explain to you that once you get to this point, you're in trouble. You're in trouble already. The moment you're here, you're in trouble. The odds of diffusing this are limited. And, and I say that from, from years of experience in a psych facility. Trust me, this is the last place and the last time we wanted to intervene. Because by then, I need Keith. <laughs> um, face is tense with a furrowed brow. You know that brow? My daughter says it looks like somebody put a hatchet between my eyes. That, that look, right? Because what's, what's happening is the person is becoming more concentrated and more focused even as they're fighting this notion as, as of becoming more diffuse. As they begin to lose control, they're struggling for control, and these attempts to focus start to become visible. The hands typically get balled up. Uh, the breathing becomes irregular and shallow. Speech, be do you know what pressured speech is? How many of you, uh, water hose, right? You shoot the hose, and then you put your thumb on it, right? Pressured speech sounds like this, like it's having trouble getting out. Like somebody put the thumb over my vocal cords. And, but that struggle to get things out is, is the battle between kind of head and heart, that, that there's this conflict. The emotional material is running so feverishly, and there's this, this, this move to try to get this material out, and it's struggling to get out. And so the speech becomes pressured. That's an exaggerated form, but, but you can tell when someone's speech becomes pressured. And then the, the questions and the statements become confused. All of this leads, uh, and then hi, this is, hi, I'll show you what hypervigilance looks like. At this point, I'm scanning the environment. I'm, I'm looking for whatever threat or whatever risk is potentially out there. And that hypervigilance, by the way, we, we haven't talked about chemical use. We haven't talked about those things. Obviously, those things can trigger all of these responses. But you don't have to be on drugs to see this or have this happen to you. We've, we've, my guess is that many of us have been in this place. And then finally, this hostile. Large muscles explode, kicking, punching, running. Uh, face muscles release. What's interesting about that release is that oftentimes, you'll see the, the muscles right before that kind of relax, which is, which is eerie. Um, breathing, it's, it's, if you've never seen it, it's wild. Um, breathing becomes a fuel source. Speech often turns to yelling and screaming, and then it becomes particularly directed. Now, just real briefly, the difference between a predator and somebody losing control. If I'm a predator in this room, who's at greatest risk? Who's at greatest risk in this room? Huh? The weakest person. Okay, so the weakest. What else? Close. Close. Okay, I'm going to get to that, Keith. The most Close. trapped. The most trapped? Actually, if I'm a predator, no one in this room is at risk. None. None of you. Because the predator's job is to create as much damage as, can, as possible with incurring the least amount of damage. If I go, the common response is smallest person in the room. So I target Cammy, right? You guys would be on me like that, like that. The truth is, a good predator is going to say, at some point, she's going to have to go to her car. At some point, it's going to be dark. At some point, she's going to be alone, right? I worked in a facility where we had this big kid, just burly, burly kid. And he was picking on this little kid, and this little kid knew no chance against this big guy. And uh, I remember like it was yesterday. I worked in a facility where uh, this was not a psychiatric facility. This was a, a residential facility. And we, we dealt with a lot of bullies. Well, this little kid wasn't a bully. He was a predator. And this is what he told the bully. He said, you might beat me up today. I might get my ass kicked. But at some point, you're going to go to sleep. The problem is you're not going to 
that bully never picked on that kid again. Uh, and we didn't have that kid anymore because he was inappropriate for that setting. That was, that was well beyond. Now, he was this big in a real fight, nothing. But that bully was goners. He was going to be a goner. The predator maximized damage and incurred the least amount of damage. When somebody loses control, the person nearest to them becomes the most likely target. So if I'm standing next to Mike and I'm losing control, Mike's in trouble, right? If I'm standing next to Keith, it, even, even if Keith is bigger and stronger than me, it doesn't matter. When somebody's losing control, they're not making an assessment. They're not going, hmm, I wonder what the odds are of me taking. <laughs> a predator is. A good predator is going to say, I need to catch him when he's not looking, when he least expects it, when, when the, 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 the environment is in my favor, OK? So an important distinction would be that one person is Predators lose control isn't doing it to damage someone else either. They're not. In yeah. fact, what, what often happens, Mike, is that right after an initial uh, strike or move or whatever, it, it extinguishes as a general rule on its own. So I've been bitten, I've been punched, I've been kicked, I've been whatever. It's fascinating how often once that control gets exerted, the need to be, the, the need to demonstrate control is no longer there. It's amazing how fast that goes away. Very unlike a predator. A predator is completely planned. A good, well, that's not true. There are impulsive types, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> so this is the continuum of intervention. Your student, if your student is behaving in a way that shows some of these signs, and you understand their baseline, it becomes critical to intervene. You want, you want to intervene as early as possible. Now here's, here's the kicker about the whole thing. This is the kicker. Oftentimes, our students lose control because we lose control. And what happens is, as Mike begins to decompensate, when he gets anxious and starts to lose control, what happens to me? I go with him. I go with him. He raises his voice, and I go, no, Mike, you can't do that. He says, well, hell, I no, no. And so you have this mutual escalation process. Part of life is mirroring. Think about it. When, when you see some, Jeff, Jeff just has something great happen to him. He goes, hey, I just won this award. You don't go, oh, that's great. <laughs> no, we, we generally mirror. I go, right on, that's great. And if he goes, oh, man, my dog died. I'm like, wow, <laughs> right? Inappropriate, a little loopy, right? <laughs> we actually mirror. Well, what happens is as he begins to lose control, I lose control. And then it's a battle for who's in control. And at that point, we're escalating each other. And part of it is my fear I'm losing the classroom or I'm losing him, but he's already on that path of losing control. So even while our, our student is demonstrating or showing these types of signs, we actually need to stay here. It's unbelievably counterintuitive. It's unbelievably counterintuitive. Staying calm while someone around you is not is unbelievably difficult. I would argue, however, that teachers are best suited to do this. We do this all the time. We just don't usually do it with, uh, uh, on a regular basis with someone that, that, that's that big a threat. But we do it all the time. So the secret, we lose control to regain control. Let me explain how this happens. If I'm feeling out of control, what I'm going to do in my environment is exert more control. When I exert more control and that doesn't grant me any new benefits, I escalate more. I escalate more. But the intention is always the same. I'm losing control, ironically, so that I can feel a, a sense of control, inevitably. So we lose control to regain control. Um, and your escalation, if you're the instructor, you help. You help that student lose control. You become one of, one of the players in the dramatic play. Um, so the question is not how do I gain control of the classroom, the question is, how do I help the student feel in control? And again, counterintuitive, because what we generally assume is I need to be in control of the classroom. You're in control of the classroom when the, when the students feel some, some sense and ability to self-determine. When people have the capacity to self-determine, when you include them in, in your, your professional behavior wheel, when you include them in a value statement and say, let's put this together, what you've really done is you've invited them to create the culture in that classroom. It's their classroom at that point. Think about what you're doing. You're not exerting your control. 
you're saying that this is a community issue. You're part of the community, you get a say in what goes on. You've already extinguished out of control behavior before it's ever gotten there. Because you've, you've been willing to let this be decided, not by one of us, but by all of us. Can now, just, yeah? I just want to share a quick story of how this can escalate so quickly. Where I was teaching in secondary, a teacher decided to give Skittles to the kids as a reward for doing this great job. When one Skittles? Of the kids, Skittles. So when one of the kids threw a Skittle at her, it escalated to the point where she actually ended up hitting the kid with a uh, paper, and then she lost her job that day. Yep. It escalates pretty quick. So don't give Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No Skittles for you. It's very similar. Uh, had a had a coworker. This was before I became a teacher 20 years ago, who had an exemplary uh, professional record working with uh, high need and high risk youth. In fact, was employee of the year several years. Um, one day lost it, hit a kid. And I remember sitting with him in my office as I was letting him go and he said, Mike, all 20 years are gone? That doesn't seem right. And I said, yeah, all 20 years are gone. Exactly. That's exactly what just happened. And I was sad for him, but that didn't change it. That didn't change it. So, making good decisions. Um, I, I talked earlier about if, if I, I ask Mike how he's doing and he's like, eh, not that good. One of the things that I can do is I can invite him to come talk with me later. And he, by the way, just like if I'm gonna ask somebody how they feel, I'm prepared for them to tell me shitty. I'm also prepared if I say, do you wanna talk later, for them to say, no, I don't. Cool, cool. As long as, as, long as Mike's cool in the class and he knows we're good, the odds of him becoming disruptive are very little. But I will invite him again if I begin to see the signs. It's not gonna just end there where I go, well, Mike doesn't like to talk to people. No, I'll say, hey, how's it going? Again, I'll invite. What I want is I want him to have the capacity to say yes or no. That's self-determination, that's that invitation. Um, by the way, I put the position yourself nearest the door. As a general rule, in, in, when you're meeting in your office space, uh, the, if a student tears up the office, everything in the office can be replaced. You can't. So make sure that you have an exit strategy. Stay calm, non-confrontational, obviously. Again, the goal is for your, your student to feel a sense of control. Maintain a, does anyone know what professional distance is? Professional distance is generally one arm's length. Right, so personal, intimate space is this, right? Professional space, a little awkward, isn't it? <laughs> Professional space is, is this, as a general rule. When you're working with somebody that you suspect is dangerous, it's their arm length you're concerned about. Because if they take, if you're one of those with really little arms, then, then this could be problematic. And, and if Jeff's arms are really long, my goal is to keep myself safe and give them a sense of safety by, by maintaining that professional space. So I wanna be an arm's length away. The person with the longest arms wins. So maintain a professional distance. Again, the goal isn't to control the student. The goal is for the student to be in control. And by the way, I don't know what the protocols you have here. Uh, I'm clearly, it's going to be letting Keith and the gang know. Um, but it's not a bad idea in departments to create some kind of signaling, signaling system that, to let you know that you're potentially in trouble. And that's when it, by then, again, <laughs> you're talking about saving you and somebody else. That's what that's about. Get away. That's it. Okay. Questions? Sorry, did I go long? Oh, no, not bad. You're good. Yeah. Anything? You're so thorough. <laughs> <laughs> I love the feedback you give. Any questions? Oh, I yeah. must have been so thorough. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do want to iterate, iterate uh, that. So when you do go through that power struggle in your class or with the counselor, the brain, the way the brain works, it's so fired up that if you don't step away and let the brain return to normal, then there's no getting anything done. Yeah. So if it happens in your classroom, the first thing I always told my, my folks if they're having a hard time is, can you do me a favor? I just need you to go to the door and wait for me there. And wait those three minutes just to be able to let that brain calm down and then have the conversation. But if you try to have it amongst their peers, and the other thing is, you, if you embarrass them in their peers, yeah. they will fight back no matter what. That's right. So if you have that confrontation in front of their peers, you're, you're asking that power struggle always to. Be. So if it's your girlfriend. And they're. Do you engage or? 
Did your girlfriend in class? That's a different issue. Honey, I need you to go by the door. I was gonna try. I'll be there in a minute. Actually, and that's where that's why I really didn't want them to erase the the markers and, and techniques off the board. I mean it those are exactly it. You never shame a student publicly. You don't shame anybody publicly. That's that's an invitation uh, to get your ass kicked. Oh, emotionally or physically. I mean that's your like, yeah. you talk a little bit about uh, maybe breaking the kind of cycle, the, the notion of some these are not all isolated incidents. You know, mm -hmm. particularly those of us that work in classrooms, we have an ongoing relationship with students and yeah. sometimes those grow positive ways and sometimes they grow in negative ways. Mm -hmm. What can we as instructors do to help break what we see as a negative pattern? This gets back to the I statements earlier. Um, one of the things that I do with my students, and, and I'll see that I'll have a student that is repeatedly challenging, and sometimes those challenges are critical for the overall IQ of the class, that they're challenging ideas. When that challenge becomes less about an idea and more about a person, that's my indicator that this is something I need to attend to. As a general rule, I attend out of class because I don't do the, the whole shame thing. Um, and as a general rule too, I use I statements and I let them know where I'm at and what I'm feeling. And I ask for their clarification. Am I on mark with this? Bobby, here's what I felt. And what's interesting is, it's, you're hard pressed. I would never, if a student said this is how I felt, I would never argue their feeling. I have no idea. I have no context to challenge that hey, what you feel is great. It might not have been my intention, but that's irrelevant. Perception's reality. What I want them to do is, I'd want to let them know how I feel and how the relationship is going in my mind and let them give me feedback about whether my perceptions are accurate or not. Believe it or not, I could be off. Most often, I think my sensors are relatively good. And then we'll start having a discussion about how, how it can change. The key here, though, is the exertion of control. What I'd want, if, if Bobby is that person, right there. If, if Bobby is that person that I'm conflicted with or I'm having this ongoing challenge with, I'd want her to be part of the solution. So how can we change the relationship that we have to make this a better relationship for both of us? Even if it's only one of us feeling that way, as long as one of us is feeling that way, this relationship isn't as good as it could be. And so, using the I statements, asking for feedback, and creating a joint plan is a, is a great way to approach that. And that active listening, where you're saying to the person, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, totally. It really. Acknowledgement is probably one of the biggest issues, you know? Absolutely. And, and you're, what you're doing is you're, by me soliciting feedback from my student, I've just let them know that they matter. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of our students, Oftentimes, when I've been challenged in class, and it's a personal challenge, not an academic challenge, to me, oftentimes, that student is trying to create a sense of being that's, that's a little bit more elevated than what they perceive of themselves. So I want to I wanna be in the middle of the room. I want my voice heard. I want to make sure that they get that. I just don't want it to be at the cost of everybody's education. So how can I get them to, to have that sense of voice? And sometimes, as, a, as the instructor, you have to be ready to internalize what a student is bringing to the classroom totally. and be prepared to say, oh, okay, how can I incorporate this? How can I, maybe they are making a good point because yeah. oftentimes we're challenged and we don't have that reflective gene to just immediately go, oh, maybe they're actually making sense. Yeah. No, depends, depends. Yeah, actually depends and I don't know are two words teachers probably don't use enough. And you know, just like in elementary school when you empower that student that's always causing angst. Yeah. Um, you don't want to hi highlight or spotlight, but bringing them onto your side by empowering them is really beneficial. It really yeah. works. You know, it's funny. It, it's funny you bring that up, Bob, because w when you work in like in a residential unit, um, sometimes you have leaders in the room, and they're just they're negative leaders. They're 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 crap stirrers kind of thing, you know. And they're they're always stirring the pot. And one of the first things that you do is you don't disempower them. You give them responsible ways to lead. Right. So that now all of a sudden, instead of being disempowered, they're actually empowered. And they're given a choice to use it in a variety of ways. What you're doing is you're shaping the potential directions. And you do, we can do that with our students. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Good. Perfect timing, actually. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Thanks, everybody. Okay.
But I thought, I think it's, it's maybe most fitting, I know Mike had uh, referred to Keith on a few occasions, <laughs> and I think it's fitting that we uh, we end when, when this doesn't <laughs> work, yeah? Uh, when the interventions, the proactive prevention, the interventions do not work, at what point should you contact Keith and the rest of the security crew? So I think, and then also, what happens to the student or situation after they're well, referred the to The answer is, to Keith. contact us always. Never be afraid to call us, even if it's so us to show up in the classroom before class so that the people see us. Sometimes that's what it takes for some to know that yes, there are some people around who will be there. Uh, if we do show up and we have to do something with a student, there's a zero tolerance policy. Usually that student is out. So we'd rather not do that, but we will easily. So we'll be happy just to sit around and talk to her about the weather. <laughs> Just so that they see us, you see, uh, you see us, everyone feels happy and safe. Uh, know how to contact us. And the only other thing to remember is when you do call us, our radios are kind of old. They're asynchronous and not synchronous. In other words, we can't talk and hear at the same time. So, that's it. So, do you guys conduct like an investigation? No, usually if someone's being disrupted, we get there, someone says, he was disrupted, we take it. So it is the teacher's discretion is to say, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll get out of here. Because we're employees of the school, so we're gonna err on the side of the school. If a student is so disruptive that security is called, then you guys do it a couple different ways, though, too. I mean, we've had situations where, obviously, the student is having some sort of episode, and they need to be guided and removed, but perhaps not trespassed because there are mitigating factors. Um, there are other situations where, no, this is like, okay, you cross the line, you're gonna essentially be arrested. And when HPD is called, HPD is called. Sometimes security has worked with my office to say, okay, look, you know, we saw this, we know this person, we know what's going on, so this is now student time and code type thing. There are situations where if the trespass is issued and the student is removed, the trespass is good for a year, they're basically told, you can't come back on campus. Um, usually my office will get those referrals, we'll do, we'll do the investigation to say, okay, so trespass, that's real clear cut. Yep, that one's sticking. This one, mm, there may be some other stuff here that's going on and we're going to take it up a level, do a full-blown investigation, Cami gets involved, and uh, sometimes those students are returned. We had a situation a year ago or so where it made sense to have removed the students from the situation. It also made sense, five days later, to put them back on the campus on probationary status to let them finish their semester. Yeah. I just want to know how often this type of uh, disturbance occurs. How, how often do you think in a school year you actually have to remove the student from the classroom? Twice a semester. Okay. If that. Okay. So it's not a normal recurring type. Okay. Right. Because a lot of us, I don't feel safe about the student, but that's more because they're unaware of what the student's going through. Is there a conduct to the referral process? There is. Yeah. There is. Separate, probably separate uh, workshop, but um, <laughs> we've got uh, we've got a process in place. In fact, there's a referral <coughs> form. It's in the teacher handbook. It's on my webpage. Um, and uh, Cami and I can talk about student conduct stuff at uh, another session. One of the other things that might be important for people to know is this workshop is sponsored by Team Care, as Jason was explaining earlier group of professionals on the campus who meet on a regular basis, twice a month, and compare notes about students of concern and about patterns that we see on the campus and what we can do to make the whole place safer for students and faculty alike. And Keith is one of the members of Team Care. So we have instructors, we have counselors, we have administrators, we have the nurse, we have the key office, we have the security office. 
and student life. So. And one of the things that we hope happens with teen care is as um, people feel, I'm concerned about the student or I'm fearful of the student or whatever, that the referral to teen care can maybe help mitigate it becoming a student conduct case. You know, because our preference would be to have less student conduct cases and, and have more incidences that are mitigated so that it doesn't have to go that route. Keep from starting the fire. Right, right. We'll do a couple workshops on Student conduct, we'll do some workshops on team care. So any last <coughs> questions? For any of the speakers. Or any, yeah, any of the speakers, any point in particular I agree. If not, we'll uh, conclude the first edition of our Can we still pick your evaluation yes. form? Oh yeah. Evaluations are there for you. Uh, be on the lookout for part two, which will be in October. First in the series of eight. First in the series of eight, domestic. or second, the next one is the second in the series of eight, entitled Domestic Violence. Domestic Violence. Okay. Domestic Violence in October. And yeah, uh, visit our intranet that, site, that, also the Team Care intranet site. Um, if you go to the intranet, it's under groups and it's Team Care, and you can see um, the listing of the workshops, but also what Team Care does. And there's also the Team Care referral form on the intranet if you have a student of concern. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.